Hello, welcome to Europe PCR 2024. My name is Gabor Tot, and we are here today to discuss what is the state of, of mechanical circulatory support in the treatment of cardiogenic shock and myocardial infarction. I'm happy to he be here today with Alaida Kiefo, who will help us to better understand the field. So, treatment of cardiogenic shock and myocardial infarction, it's a disaster. It has still a very high mortality and, and we are kind of desperate to help this patient somehow. And therefore, ECLS shock trial was a huge disappointment for us. How you would interpret the results of this trial in the perspective of daily practice? Yes, it was quite disappointing. It's a neutral trial, so there was no benefit uh, with uh, a prophylactic use of ECMO for all uh, class of sky from C to E. Uh, in patients with uh, acute MI complicated by cardiogenic shock. But uh, we have to see this in perspective, look into the inclusion criteria of the patient. On one side, we had uh, not so disease cardiogenic shock because almost half were class C, where normally you don't use ECMO in acute MI to start with. And on the other end, you had very severely diseased patient because there was 77% of patient in cardiac arrest with a median time more than 20 minutes. So maybe it was too late. On one side too early, one side too late. And also the practice on that trial, they did implant ECMO mostly during the procedure or at the end of the procedure. So maybe when the patient was collapsing in the in the car lab and uh, they did not do unloading, mechanical unloading, because only 5% of the patients that were randomized in the ECMO group indeed uh, had uh, a mechanical unloading on board. And we all know that in the setting of an acute MI, it's very important since uh, the ECMO is increasing the afterload that you use mechanical unloading mm. you know, to preserve the LVF. So that, that's the point. Uh, so we, so can, we can believe that with uh, some fine-tuning of patient selection, better understanding who is in real need, and also fine-tuning of the best timing for initiating the therapy might improve the outcome of MCS-supported patients. Sure. So in ECMO, should be more selective, not too early. I mean, most probably in DAE, when there are in biventricular mm. failure but not after 20 not minutes of cardiac arrest, mm. maybe it's, it's a bit too late. Danger shock, new news from uh, this year or recently, giving a bit more hope that we might have a tool to, to, to treat this patient group. How you would interpret the results of this yeah, trial? Yeah, that was finally a positive trial. So for all the one of us that are very active in the taking care of acute uh, uh, MI cardiogenic shock patient. It was a very positive result. It was a different trial because in this trial there was a more precise patient selection. Uh, so uh, they were included always C to E uh, cardiogenic shock. Mostly they were class C and uh, this patient uh, had to have uh, an onset of symptoms to treatment of six hours. So they were in the what is called golden hour of cardiogenic shock. And uh, in the majority of the patient, the large majority, the device was implanted before primary PCI. So completely different uh, management of this uh, patient, very best uh, protocol practice. And by the way, the endpoint was different because it was not 30 days, but was 180 days and there was a benefit on uh, mortality. And this patient received a micro-axillary micro flow pump and not yes. for ECMO. Still, do you think that in the treatment group of this study, we can still fine-tune something on the practices compared to the trial? There were quite high rate of, uh, of puncture site complications, and so maybe we can still improve there's something on our, on our practice to make the results even better. How yeah, sure. I mean, it's uh, clearly that study was done in 10 years. It's an investigator-driven study with all uh, the difficulties to do a study in cardiogenic shock patient. Because if you want to keep the quality high and to have uh, uh, centers that are shock center in, uh, these uh, delayed uh, uh, the time of uh, uh, complete, to complete the enrollment. And clearly there were also some early stage where most probably there were less experience in dealing with large bone access. Uh, clearly with expertise uh, uh, with large bone access uh, and with these devices, uh, uh, we can clearly 
reduce the rate of complication because there was still some device related complication on the access side that clearly nowadays we can manage with uh, for example ultrasound puncture of the vascular access you can pre-close the access uh, you have to be more meticulous but i think this was also impacted from the time of enrollment is 10 year time so 10 years ago uh, most probably there was less taking care of uh, the best practice of vascular, vascular access. Okay, so now 2024, considering these uh, two more or less recent trials, how we can put it on perspective of our daily practice with all the, what you mentioned, uh, critical thinking about the results and the design of the trials. What you would suggest, how you would do, which patient doesn't need it yet, which patient needs already, and for which patient is it already too late to go with one or other uh, me uh, mechanical circulatory support device in cardiogenic shock? So first is timing. Timing to transfer of this patient to cardiogenic shock center. So a lot should be done on the up and spoke uh, network design. We did a lot with the STEMI network. We should do something similar with cardiogenic shock because we know that there are golden hours of treatment of cardiogenic shock. And these two trials give you the idea if uh, there is a long cardiac arrest, how much you can do for a patient. And indeed, on the other side, under shock with the microaxial flow pump, but the time of onset of symptoms were quite short. So timing of transfer, building up networks uh, and patient selection. So if uh, there is a patient coming with, uh, in the golden hours, uh, my first uh, device to implant is a microaxial flow pump, unless the patient is in cardiac arrest, uh, unless the patient has a biventricular failure and I go with ECMO to start with. But uh, it's not one device that should take care of all. Uh, the strategy should be a multi-strategy. So use the device that you have in your car labs and be able then to escalate because what is also important is the capability to escalate. You can start with the microaxial flow pump with a certain capability, but then if the patient is not improving, you can up escalate. You can up escalate to a more powerful uh, microaxial flow pump or if the patient is going very badly with biventricular failure, you can think about to implant a right microaxial flow pump or ECMO. It depends on your capability. But always manage the patient in a multidisciplinary approach. Because as interventional cardiology, we implant the device, but then these patients are taken care by our intensivists. So it should be a common multi-strategy effort in dedicated cardiogenic shock center. Okay, thank you, Elida. So just to put it uh, together, what we discussed, the keys are best understanding what is the good timing to have a very prestigious implantation technique to avoid complications and to manage these patients in a multidisciplinary approach, then we can hope the benefit from uh, these tools in this very high mortality population to gain some benefit from this. Thank you very much. Thanks to you.